All right. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about pharmacology. Um, and I am actually going to have a friend of mine, his name is Jeff, do this presentation. He is extremely knowledgeable about the subject of pharmacology. He kind of eats, lives, and breathes this stuff. And he has agreed to go ahead and share a lecture of his with you. I think this is going to meet all of your needs and give you a very well-rounded view of pharmacology, um, how those actions happen within the body, and uh, a good brief history of um, pharmacokinetics and how we have come to be where we are. So I'm going to share this with you and we'll move through the PowerPoints. These are going to be different PowerPoints than are posted on your page, but I will post this PowerPoint for you as well. So enjoy. This is about an hour and 25 minutes. Uh, please pause it if you get a little bit um, dry or if you need to just jump up and stretch your legs. Um, this is going to encompass quite a bit, so please take your time and take good notes. Here we go. Get our PowerPoint up here. Okay. And uh, here we go. Uh, basic principles of pharmacology. Um, I think it's important that we have an understanding of um, the medications and how they work. Uh, we're often asked to give medications that may be outside our scope or aren't necessarily within the uh, our protocols, particularly if you're hospital-based, and uh, I think it's important that as a paramedic that um, prior to ever giving any medication that you know the indications, contraindications, side effects, dose, how supplied, that sort of stuff. So today we're going to look at um, some basic principles of pharmacology. We're going to describe pharmacological historic trends. We're going to differentiate chemical, generic, trade uh, names of drugs. We're going to list the main sources of drug products, describe how drugs are classified, list authoritative sources for drug information. We're going to talk about some of the legislative acts controlling drug use and abuse in the United States. Uh, we're going to differentiate between Schedule 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 substances, as well as list examples. We're going to discuss the standardization of drugs. We're also going to discuss investigational drugs, including the Food and Drugs Administration approval process and classification for newly approved drugs. We're going to discuss the paramedic's responsibility and scope of management pertinent to the administration of medications. We're going to review some specific anatomy and physiology pertinent to pharmacology with attention to the autonomic pharmacology, because as you'll see, most of the drugs that we uh, administer affect the autonomic nervous system uh, to include the uh, sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. We're going to list and describe general drug properties, uh, list and describe liquid solid drug forms, list and differentiate drug administration routes including enteral and parenteral routes, um, describe the mechanisms of drug action, list and differentiate phases of drug activity, including uh, pharmaceutical, pharmacokinetic, and pharmacodynamic phases. Um, I'm going to describe the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, including the theories of drug action, drug response relation, factors altering drug responses, predictable drug responses, iatrogenic drug responses. And iatrogenic is a, a word that um, just just means that we make it ourself. Uh, as an example, adrenaline, uh, you'll learn to give epinephrine, and uh, we make uh, epinephrine our, ourselves. Uh, you'll learn to give dopamine, we make our own dopamine. Uh, there are many drugs that are synthetic that uh, we give when the patient's own uh, hormones aren't working. Um, we'll also discuss special considerations in drug treatments regarding pregnant patients, pediatric patients, and geriatric patients. Uh, we'll differentiate drug interactions. We'll discuss considerations for storing and securing medications and list the components of a drug profile by classification. So a drug is defined as a substance intended to diagnose, cure, relieve, treat, and prevent disease. 
and all drugs affect the structure and function of the body. Now, pharmacology is the study of drugs, particularly how they affect the structure and function of the body. And when we go and look at the historic or the history behind uh, pharmacology, uh, we go back to ancient healthcare, uh, even before Hippocrates. Uh, most of the medicine provided uh, was in the form of potions or uh, religious rituals or prayers, uh, even some real crude surgeries. Uh, the Greco-Romans combined medicine with religion, and Hippocrates, uh, the father of medicine, uh, uh, gave us, uh, debatably, the Hippocratic Oath that uh, physicians still say today before, or, you know, before becoming physicians, where uh, if nothing else, to do no harm. And then Claudius Galen was the father of pharmacy. He picked up where Hippocrates left off, uh, and he brought Greco-Roman medicine to its height. Uh, he did things like bloodletting, uh, leeches, he had potions, or herbal jams, uh, dream interpretations, and many of his theories on medicine are, are still true today. During the Renaissance, after the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, many people for pharmacy were reverted back to folklore, herbs, uh, tradition. Um, the Muslims, the Greeks, the Romans, and the Jews combined the, the knowledge of math and science and created formularies for the very first uh, pharmacopoeia, uh, an actual listing of uh, the formulas uh, for uh, the chemical makeup of these uh, early drugs. Paracelsus was the uh, father of toxicology, and, and uh, he f was the one that introduced remedies to fight disease. Uh, he's uh, known for saying that, you know, everything around us is toxic. Uh, the dose is what makes it not toxic. Um, some other major medicine discoveries in the 17th century, uh, belladonna was discovered, uh, which is atropine. That's where atropine comes from. Uh, and as you'll learn, atropine is an anticholinergic and very important in uh, the treatment of uh, parasympathetic stimulation as well as uh, organophosphate poisoning and um, weapons of mass destruction like deadly nerve agents. In the 18th century, uh, purple foxglove yielded digitalis, and um, uh, digitalis was a first-generation drug used to control heart rate. So, uh, you know, at one point, 70% of the people over 70 were um, uh, had atrial fibrillation and took digitalis. So it was a really common uh, medication that uh, you'll come across. Um, there are third and fourth generation drugs now that um, control rate, like beta blockers and calcium channel blockers and those sort of things. Uh, but DIG was, uh, you know, an 18th century drug that uh, saved a lot of lives. In the 19th century, uh, we saw opium and morphine and quinine, and, and these drugs became very important medically uh, to alleviate pain and to um, and to, and to sedate uh, people as well. Um, however, their um, the ability to uh, uh, to get hooked on these medications uh, and become dependent upon them was so high that they had to be regulated. And perhaps one of the greatest, in my opinion, uh, discoveries in major medicine uh, had to do with insulin. Uh, insulin was not discovered until uh, 1922. Uh, prior to that, if you had diabetes, you died a horrible death. Um, so your type 1 diabetics uh, often didn't make it out of uh, childhood, and adult onset diabetics, um, you know, eventually developed diabetic ketoacidosis and died. Um, the disease diabetes uh, was known uh, as early as Hippocrates. Uh, Hippocrates gave it its name, diabetes, which means uh, to siphon water, because he uh, noticed that um, you know patients that had this affliction, uh, this diabetes, uh, peed a lot. Uh, he didn't know why, uh, and it wasn't until the 1900s, uh, you know, 1920s that uh, people understood that diabetes was a disease of the pancreas. <coughs> Excuse me. 
so uh, <clears throat> and that the pancreas secreted it. So, uh, in my opinion, that was a major medical discovery. Now, when we look at modern healthcare. Uh, we had to start. You know, we, not that I had anything to do with it, but pharmaceutical laws were enacted in the late 19th century and the 20th century to help protect the public. Uh, you know that uh, certainly prevented the old snake oil salesmen from, you know. pandering uh, um, castor oil with a little wintergreen in it uh, as a cure-all for everything that ailed you. Um, drugs were developed uh, to improve chronic illnesses and treatments uh, in the, uh, again, 19th century, it included things like phenobarbital for the treatment of, uh, of seizures, uh, tetanus antitoxin to prevent tetanus, and of course, uh, you know, one of the first generation antibiotics that uh, wiped out much disease and sickness in, in the world was uh, penicillin. In 1950, uh, there were more changes in pharmacology than any other time in history. Uh, as I had mentioned, we're, we're now into our third and fourth generation of medication development. And what I mean by that is, you know, the first drug that uh, came out to regulate the heart rate might have been your digitalis. And usually first drugs were beneficial but had lots of side effects. Um, and as uh, new generations of drugs are developed, uh, they are more effective with fewer side effects. And so we're into like our fourth generation of medicine development. Um, and we'll continue to see changes, new meds. And that's why it's important that as a paramedic that you keep up on your pharmacology because, you know, I think of the meds that I gave as a paramedic uh, when I first became a paramedic in the 70s. Um, you know, we were we were giving drugs like neosinephrine IV and calcium chloride IV and all these things that we don't give anymore. Uh, we have far better drugs that, that work more effective with fewer side effects. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's important that we, we understand that uh, drugs are constantly being researched and developed, and uh, we need to keep abreast of that. Now, drugs have a chemical name, and that's a lengthy description of the drug's chemical composition and molecular structure. Uh, and then they have an official name. That's the name that's listed in the U.S. Pharmacopeia. And the United States Pharmacopeia is a, a book that lists all medications uh, that are on the market here in the United States. Um, drugs may have a generic name, and that's a non-proprietary name. Uh, and that's first proposed by the manufacturer when they submit it to the FDA for approval. And then trade names are... Uh, a brand or proprietary name, uh, and that's the patented name. As an example, Tylenol is the trade name. Uh, acetaminophen is the generic name. And uh, when the company that developed acetaminophen uh, uh, got the patent on Tylenol, there was nowhere else you could get acetaminophen. Uh, Tylenol had the patent for multiple years, uh, which uh, protected the company and helped uh, recover expenses to uh, create the drug, but once the patent wore off, then now we have all kinds of, of uh, generic acetaminophen out there. Uh, sources of drugs. Drugs come from uh, plants, animals, humans, uh, minerals and mineral products, uh, synthetic chemical substances, uh, and we'll look at some of each of these, and then recombinant DNA technology. Um, plants give us uh, alkaloids, and alkaloids contain nitrogen, and they're drugs that uh, end in INE. As an example, atropine, caffeine, codeine, uh, those are all alkaloids. Uh, glycosides, um, when um, separated, yield a sugar, uh, and digitalis from the purple foxglove plant is a glycoside. Uh, gums, we get that from plants, and uh, opium gum is an example of that that uh, certainly we can't buy <laughs> over the counter. Uh, and then oils, uh, oil of wintergreen, which is a salicylate, and salicylates uh, uh, are the base compound for aspirin. So an oil of wintergreen not only has that uh, wintergreen menthol sort of smell and about it, but it also uh, helps relieve joint pain and that sort of thing because it is a salicylate. 
Um, from animals and humans, we can extract hormones, uh, we can develop vaccines, uh, we can develop, uh, we can get blood uh, and blood plasma products, packed red cells, uh, that sort of stuff. We also can get insulin, thyroid, and estrogen, those are hormones. Uh, and then minerals and mineral products, we can get things like uh, milk and magnesia. Um, Chemical substances are developed by uh, scientifically duplicating specific compounds that are found in the body, but because they're made in a lab, because they're synthetic, um, they're free of impurities, uh, which probably make them uh, you know, certainly um, safer. Uh, recombinant DNA technology, uh, that's uh, genetic engineering, DNA sequencing, uh, that's where we got things like insulin. Uh, was a result of recombinant DNA technology. Erythropoietin is a medication that helps you uh, make red cells uh, in those patients who are uh, uh, having difficulty making red cells, and erythropoietin will help them create and make new uh, red cells. And then human growth hormone uh, is, you know, what it says. It, it helps uh, growth. Um, as far as drugs uh, class, classifications, uh, they're classified into uh, anatomical or therapeutic or chemical. Uh, and this was uh, controlled by the World Health Organization, and it's broken down by uh, the body system. What is the drug's physiologic classification? You know, is it a respiratory drug, a central nervous system drug, that sort of stuff? Uh, the mechanism of action or the drug's therapeutic classification is an antihypertensive, a diuretic, an antipyretic. Uh, you know, what what basically does the drug do? And then the class of uh, of agent. Uh, which is the, the drug's chemical classification, and they include examples like uh, a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor. And we'll learn more about all these drugs as we go through our program. Now, where would you find sources on drug information? Well, the United States Pharmacopeia, uh, again, is the national formulary, and that's the official source for all United States manufactured drugs. Uh, their chemical name is in there that sort of stuff. The Physician's Desk Reference uh, is a compilation of over 4,000 plus drugs and quarterly. Uh, this is a, a this is a, a large volume hard bound book that is published every year uh, and then quarterly as new drugs come out onto the market and get approval then updates are uh, sent out in uh, paper form. And I'm sure today that's probably something you can get a uh, an app on your smartphone or that sort of thing, but uh, it used to be a pretty pretty handy reference uh, because it had just about any drug you can think of in there. Uh, the American Hospital Formulary Service, uh, and this has information about every United States drug uh, available, and uh, it, its uses for drugs included in labeling approved by the FDA and off-label uses. So hospital formularies. Um, not every hospital carries exactly the same drugs. Uh, it really depends on the medical staff and the type of drugs they like to use. Um, and so uh, we may talk about a particular drug, and if you go back, chances are your hospital will have it. Um, but there are hospital pharmacies that uh, don't carry every drug out there. Um, one of my, uh, <clears throat> you know, when you when you first open a, a drug uh, package uh, from the pharmacy, uh, there's a package insert, and the package insert has all the drug safety and effectiveness information in it. It's kind of like a material safety data sheet uh, for medications, or a safety data sheet for medications. But the package inserts. Uh, also are very similar to the pages right out of the uh, physician's desk reference. And then, of course, there's a, a variety of other sources where you can get drug information, whether it's uh, through your nurse friends or uh, physicians, your pharmacist, uh, poison control. Uh, and again, there's, there's multiple pharmacy uh, smartphone apps uh, as well, drug formulary smartphone apps as well. Now, because drugs 
but certainly can be harmful if it's uh, taken, uh, taken not as prescribed. Uh, we've had to do, the United States has uh, laws that govern the purchase, distribution, dispense, and administration of, of drugs. And each state, uh, their Department of Pharmacy, the Iowa State Department of Pharmacy, uh, regulates all our medications. Uh, and regulates them depending upon where they're being dispensed from. Uh, as an example, you know, certainly medications that are, you know, um, controlled substances, uh, they have to be double locked. And in an ambulance, that can be a challenge. Uh, you know, if you lock the drug box and you lock uh, the ambulance, then that might be considered double locked. Uh, and they're supposed to be double locked when nobody is. You know, presence of them, and we know that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, the purpose of the legislation is to protect the public from adulterated or mislabeled drugs. Uh, and the Pure Food and Drug Act uh, uh, required that drugs have a, a standardized name, uh, that the strength is listed, uh, the quality and purity of the drugs is regulated through that act uh, as well. Uh, Pure Food and Drug Act uh, came out in the early 20th century. The Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of uh, 1938 uh, dealt with um, uh, again more drug labeling. Uh, the Harrison Narcotic Act of 1914 defined what a narcotic was and started to regulate the sale and use of opium and codeine. Uh, and identified specific fines and imprisonment for um, illegally dispensing those drugs. You know, as you, um, uh, you know, early uh, Coca-Cola uh, had um, uh, cocaine in it. So, uh, you know, that had to be taken out uh, because it was defined as a, a narcotic. The Durham-Humphrey Amendments of 1928 required prescriptions for certain drugs uh, and that all new drugs had to be tested for toxicity. Uh, the Durham-Humphrey Amendment of 1951 required the uh, placement of warning labels on, uh, on uh, medications that would cause drowsiness or that sort of stuff. Don't operate heavy equipment. I'm sure you've seen the labels. Uh, the uh, Kefauver-Harrison Amendment in 1962 required proof of effectiveness uh, safety of a new prescription uh, over-the-counter drugs uh, before FDA approval. Um, so, uh, over-the-counter drugs, um, you know, had to go through a rigorous um, process as well before they could be uh, purchased over-the-counter. And some drugs may begin as uh, prescription drugs only, uh, and then. Um, at some point, uh, they're just over the counter. A good example of that is Nexium. Uh, Nexium is the uh, H2 blocker that uh, people take for um, excess stomach gas and acid. And um, uh, you, when it first came on the market, you had to have a prescription to buy it, but now you can buy it over the counter. The schedule of controlled substances are classifications of substances based on their accepted medical use in the United States. And those drugs that are, you know, uh, more likely to be abused uh, and uh, uh, more likely to, uh, to become addicted on uh, certainly have a higher classification. The Food and Drug Administration is the governing body that oversees the general safety standards in the production of drugs, and food, and cosmetics. And uh, that falls under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And uh, they also regulate medical devices and radiation emitting products like um, microwaves and uh, radios and cell phones and those things. Uh, Drug Enforcement Administration is under the U.S. Department of Justice and the uh, DEA enforces controlled substance laws, uh, monitors the need for changing abuse drug schedules. And the uh, Federal Trade Commission its Bureau of Consumer Protection protects the consumer in truth and advertising laws. In other words, if a particular manufacturer of a drug says it does this, then there has to be proof that it in fact does. 
Now, uh, the standardization of drugs, uh, <clears throat> we look at these terms, uh, an assay uh, is a substance test uh, to find components. Uh, it looks at the amount of the medication in the uh, actual drug uh, that's being dispensed as well as how pure it is. Um, uh, the labs uh, within your hospital take blood and run assays on your blood as well. Uh, to look for uh, substances in the blood, uh, the amount, uh, that sort of stuff. So uh, it's a substance test to find components. The bioassay is um, uh, how the drug affects uh, an organism, and it will compare results uh, with an agreed-upon standard that uh, – with an agreed-upon standard, yep. Now, the United States Pharmacopeia is uh, the official standard setting authority uh, in, in the United States for uh, standardization of drugs. Now, some drugs are still under the investigational stage, and uh, they have to be evaluated. And what a pharmaceutical company has to do is um, provide conceptual evidence that the drug has physiologic benefit and that uh, they also have to identify what the toxic level of this drug would be, how the drug is absorbed, uh, how it's metabolized. Uh, they have to then conduct studies on uh, tissue and then animals, uh, and then bring that in front of the uh, Food and Drug Administration for approval. And if the uh, FDA approves the uh, new drug application, uh, it goes through a vigorous uh, four or five phase process before it's actually approved. Um, uh, but once it gets through those phases uh, of the FDA's investigation, then uh, if it passes muster, then it'll be allowed out on the market uh, uh, to be sold. Um, so the phases of investigation is uh, phase one, they have to require specific information and effects on humans. And then there are three phases conducted before the, the new drug application is even submitted. And then the fourth phase uh, follows the new drug application approval, but uh, it's not closely monitored by the FDA. Um, the new drug application uh, includes a um, sponsor goal, the person who's making the drug, the pharmaceutical company that's making the drug. You know, why are you making the drug? Um, how is it safe? Uh, what... Um, uh, how's the drug going to work? You know, how, how is, what's the intent of the drug? How is it going to work? Uh, is it safe? And uh, does it justify commercial development? Um, now, for generic drugs, these are drugs that uh, have already been approved, that have already gone through that extensive process. They just may change one uh, small uh, molecular makeup of the drug. Um, and so the preclinical and clinical data isn't required because that's already been done. Um, they just have to demonstrate that their generic drug uh, performs as the original patented drug does. Now, as a paramedic, you're going to be administering medications, and uh, we need to make certain that, um, you know, that we understand the medications that we're giving. Uh, and in order to give the drug safely and effectively, uh, that requires us to, uh, you know, assess the scene and assess the patient, get a good history, and uh, know and understand what medications the patient takes, because, um, you know, medications we give uh, may uh, may counteract with medications that they're taking, uh, or medications that they're taking may um, hide or um, prevent us from uh, seeing the normal signs and symptoms we would uh, for a patient's condition. As an example, uh, if a patient is taking beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, uh, when they go into shock, uh, we would expect to see a rapid heart rate, but if they're taking beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, that might not happen. So we got to have a, a good understanding of, of their history and the medications that they're taking. Uh, and then, you know, does the condition we're assessing uh, need this particular medication that we're carrying, and are there any contraindications for us giving this to the patient? 
Um, we also want to look at patient pill bottles uh, and get the information exactly as it's uh, laid out there, uh, how many they take, what the strength is, how often they take it, and certainly if there's ever a need to um, uh, consider maybe the patient has taken more medication, uh, we see this is as a condition called polypharmacy in elder patients who, you know, once they start taking five or more meds, they can get confused and uh, maybe double take their meds in a day, that sort of stuff. So, uh, you know, you might see a, a toxic, uh, cardiotoxic event uh, if they've uh, taken multiple calcium channel blockers because they've forgotten or multiple beta blockers just because they forgot they took it. So looking at their pill bottle and their prescription, if, it, you know, if the prescription says uh, there's 30 pills in here and they take one a day and it was filled, you know, five days ago, but there's only 10 pills in there, um, you know, they've taken way too many. Uh, ask the patient how they've been taking their medication because they may not be taking it correct. Um, when you're going to give a med, uh, you know, it's important that you make certain that the dose the medicate, you know, you do the, the five rights, you know, and we'll talk about that in the next chapter, but you do the five rights. So check with your partner, uh, use drug references, recheck your calculation and dosages, uh, and if you're not sure, contact medical control. Um, we have responsibilities when it comes to administering medications. Certainly there are legal responsibilities. If we have a medication that uh, can make a difference in a patient's condition, uh, you know, certainly we have the legal responsibility to administer it. <clears throat> we also have uh, moral and ethical obligations, uh, the ability to leave, uh, relieve pain. Um, you know, we have that ability. So it's important that when caring for patients who are in pain or who are anxious, that um, you know, following a thorough assessment, if the indication is there, that we give them something to uh, alleviate their pain. Uh, and we're going to give our drugs according to their intended use, uh, according to our written protocols. And um, we're going to learn, um, uh, I mean, we're not only going to give patients medications that we care for, uh, but we're also going to learn what sort of meds a person is on. And knowing what sort of meds a person is on uh, will uh, tell us about their medical history. And their medical history is something that uh, many people would rather uh, it remained private and confidential. Uh, so as an example, if you, you know, certainly uh, uh, are taking care of a patient and you find out that, you know, they're taking uh, metformin and, uh, and they're taking um, Lantus and those sort of things, those are diabetic drugs and uh, they may not want people to know that they're diabetic. Uh, so it's important that we maintain uh, patient confidentiality, and that we use professionalism uh, at all time, particularly in those situations when, uh, as an example, they're taking, uh, you know, erectile dysfunction drugs and that sort of stuff. Um, when we look at the nervous system organization and function concerning uh, medications, uh, we're going to talk briefly about the central nervous system, which includes the brain, the spinal cord, and we know that the importance of the uh, spinal cord is to receive and send uh, impulses to the brain for interpretation. And uh, through those nerves, uh, motor nerves uh, uh, cause movement of muscle. Uh, but certainly we have sensors uh, on our skin that, that can uh, relay temperature, uh, vibration, sensation, pressure, uh, pleasure, pain, uh, all those sort of things uh, are part of the central nervous system. Now, the peripheral nervous system are all nerves outside the central nervous system, and they include the somatic nervous system, which is the, um, uh, which is the uh, sensory and uh, motor nerves that come off of uh, the spinal cord, um, and cranial nerves, uh, which come directly from the brain uh, and take care of most everything from the shoulders up. Uh, you've got 12 pair of cranial nerves, uh, and then you've got uh, two motor and two sensory nerves uh, coming out of each vertebrae, uh, two on the left, two on the right. Uh, and they uh, innervate all parts of your uh, skeletal muscles and send messages back and forth. Uh, and they control um, uh, 
voluntarily uh, and consciously. In other words, you decide if you want to, you know, move an arm or move a leg or that sort of thing. Um, the autonomic nervous system, uh, that's involuntary control. That includes the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, and the we don't have any control over that. I mean, I mean, we do to a, a degree. Can We can get our heart rate up a little bit. Uh, but, you know, we can't uh, stop breathing. We can for a short period, but eventually we're going to have to take a breath because uh, we just really don't have uh, finite control over the uh, autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nerve uh, systems uh, send messages and receive messages from the heart, the secretory glands, the GI tract, smooth muscles, blood vessels, bronchi, and the genital urinary system. The uh, um, autonomic nervous system is um, uh, divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, we'll talk more about those here in just a minute. So uh, just a quick review, the central nervous system includes the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system includes the somatic nervous system, which is your sensory motor nerves. Uh, and then the autonomic nervous system includes the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system uh, control multiple uh, functions in your body. Uh, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system uh, oppose each other every minute of every day. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system, when stimulated, dilates the pupils. Uh, dries you up, uh, increases sweating, accelerates the heart rate, dilates the bronchioles, um, uh, causes the secretion of adrenaline, uh, and decreases digestive functions in the intestines. Um, where when the parasympathetic nervous system is uh, stimulated, uh, it constricts your pupils, it increases your salivation, it slows your heart rate down, it constricts your bronchioles. It increases digestive functions and increases the uh, movement of um, the uh, digestive, um, increases movement in the intestines and contracts the bladder. Uh, so, you know, they oppose each other. Uh, and it's important that they do that because if one of those systems is unopposed, and that happens when we give medications or certain conditions, uh, happen with the patient. As an example, organophosphate poisoning. Um, the, the medication that we give to treat that uh, may cause the sympathetic nervous system to be unopposed and uh, the heart rate can get out of control, that sort of thing. So the nervous system organization and function. We've got that peripheral nervous system, the sympathetic division. Um, uh, peripheral nervous system autonomic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system. So that's where we're at. <clears throat> the sympathetic nervous system is called the fight or flight nervous system. Because when that is stimulated, when that sympathetic nervous system is stimulated, adrenaline is released from the adrenal glands as well as uh, uh, norepinephrine and dopamine, uh, aldosterone, cortisol, all those things are released when the sympathetic nervous system is uh, stimulated. And it prepares you to fight or flight. Uh, you know, it prepares you to fight. Your pupils dilate so you can see better. Uh, your heart rate accelerates to pump more blood and oxygen to your tissues. Your bronchioles dilate so you can take in more uh, uh, oxygen. Um, the parasympathetic nervous system. <clears throat> the parasympathetic nervous system is called the feed and breed resting and digesting nervous system. Uh, and when it's stimulated, uh, it releases uh, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter for the parasympathetic nervous system, just like adrenaline is the neurotransmitter for the sympathetic nervous system. And when that parasympathetic nervous system is uh, stimulated and acetylcholine is released, your pupils constrict your heart rate slows down, your bronchioles constrict, uh, your gut motility and your intestinal motility increase.
increases. Uh, so that's what happens when those systems are um, stimulated. And it, it, the stimulation of those nervous system is all in response to neurochemicals. And they are transmitted uh, through the um, synapsis or synaptic transmission. Uh, on one end of the nervous system, you have pregangliomic neurons or pregangliomic fibers, and that's where your neurotransmitters are. Uh, that's where your adrenaline, that's where your acetylcholine, that's where your neurotransmitters are. And on the other end of this uh, uh, neuron is the, the postganglionic end of the neuron. And that's where the receptor sites of the organs are. Um, when a neurotransmitter is released into the bloodstream, like adrenaline or uh, acetylcholine, um, they travel through these neurons uh, to the from the preganglionic neuron to the postganglionic neuron, uh, where they um, make their way into the receptor sites on your organs and cause a predictable response. You know, adrenaline is going to cause the heart to accelerate. It's going to cause the bronchioles to dilate. Uh, you know, acetylcholine is going to cause the heart to slow. So, depending on which nervous system is stimulated, um, these neurotransmitters reach the receptor sites and cause a predictable uh, site uh, response. Uh, ganglions are where the uh, central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, connect with the peripheral nervous system. And the uh, synaptic junction is the space where these neurons meet. Uh, CNS and per peripheral nerves come in contact, uh, or where many nerves, nerves, uh, neurons in the, in the brain, uh, you know, where they where they come together, one neuron, neuron meeting another neuron. There's a space between there known as the synapse, or the synaptic junction, uh, and the neurotransmitter is in the preganglia preganglionic neuron, like we said, and the receptor is in the postganglionic. And the neurotransmitters are uh, for the um, parasympathetic nervous system, uh, acetylcholine. And that's why that nervous system is also called the cholinergic nervous system. Uh, you'll hear the parasympathetic nervous system referred as the cholinergic nervous system because acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. And the sympathetic nervous system neurotransmitter is adrenaline. Uh, and that's why that's also called the adrenergic nervous system. Uh, so you'll hear people call the sympathetic nervous system the adrenergic nervous system because adrenaline is the neurotransmitter. And when these neurotransmitters are released into the bloodstream, the acetylcholine and adrenaline, we're going to get a predictable response. And sometimes there's too much of the adrenaline. Sometimes there's too much of the acetylcholine. And uh, we can recognize that by what they do and we have medications to reverse that. Um, the acetylcholine interacts with the receptors and uh, one of the physiological responses that we see are um, the stimulation of these two receptors on the organs. You have nicotinic receptors and you have muscarinic receptors on your organs. And the muscarinic receptor, receptors cause the uh, textbook presentation of somebody who uh, has uh, uh, too much acetylcholine in their bloodstream. Uh, we call it sludge. We see this with organophosphate poison. Uh, organophosphates uh, stimulate the muscarinic receptors on your organs and cause you to sludge. Uh, salivate, lacrimate, urinate, defecate, uh, gastrointestinal upset, emesis, and meiosis which is a constriction of the pupils. So when the uh, acetylcholine is in the bloodstream in large amounts, as occurs when you're exposed to a uh, organophosphate, which is a pesticide, or a weapon of mass destruction, like a deadly nerve agent, uh, you're going to have sludge. Uh, the nicotinic receptors uh, cause um, bradycardia, tachycardia, uh, cause uh, muscle fasciculations, paralysis, and those sort of things. And that's kind of what ends up um, uh, killing the patient who's exposed to pesticides or a deadly nerve agent. 
Now, the sympathetic receptors uh, on your organs um, are also called adrenergic receptors, and they include alpha-1 and alpha-2, beta-1 and beta-2, and dopamine. And um, when um, these receptors are stimulated, when the alpha-1 and alpha-2 receptors are stimulated, we'll see primarily uh, vessel constriction. And when the beta-1, beta-1 is heart, uh, so beta-1 receptor stimulation, we'll, we'll see an increase in heart rate, strength, and um, of contraction along with some vasoconstriction. Uh, beta-2 receptors are found primarily in the lungs, and we'll see bronchodilation with beta-2 receptors. Um, and then dopamine is a unique receptor that, uh, depending on the amount of dopamine in the blood, uh, we'll see different responses. Small amounts, we'll see a dilation of the renal and mesenteric arteries. In a mid amount, we'll see um, um, an increase in heart rate and strength of contraction. And in high amounts, we'll see the vessels constrict. Um, a sympathomimetic or a sympathomimetric is a, um, a medication or a, a synthetic hormone that mimics the effect of stimulating the sympathetic nervous system. And a sympatholytic is a medication that blocks the effects of symp sympathetic stimulation. Other neurotransmitters and receptors include serotonin. Uh, and we know that uh, serotonin is important for uh, mood and uh, a lack of serotonin uh, leads to depression. Uh, we also know that endorphins can be released, and they're very similar to opiates. Uh, they're released whenever we feel stress, whenever we feel pain. Uh, and some people, uh, you know, uh, psychologically or through mind uh, concentration, are able to withstand, you know, great amounts of, of pain because of their ability to release uh, endorphins. Neuropeptides, uh, they're released by the atrium in the heart. Uh, BNP is one of them. And uh, in patients with congestive heart failure, uh, their BNP will be elevated. Um, now, the effector cell response just, just refers to the fact that uh, you have these receptors on your organs. And these receptors uh, on your organ are like uh, keyholes. And the hormones that circulate through your body uh, in the blood are like keys. And when the circulating hormones like epinephrine, acetylcholine, dopamine, you know, endorphins, serotonin, when these hormones get to the receptor sites on your organ, they slip into that keyhole and cause a predictable response. And sometimes those responses can be something we don't want, so we end up having to take medications uh, to block those receptors. You know, a good example would be a beta blocker. Uh, beta blockers block uh, beta receptor stimulation, uh, preventing the heart rate from beating fast. So a person who has a normally fast heart rate might be on a beta blocker to keep their heart rate slow down. Uh, receptor regulation. Uh, receptors can be uh, kind of down regulation decrease the number of receptor sites available, and up re re regulation uh, is an increase in the number of receptors available. Um, uh, we can alter these neurotransmitters with drugs that are synthetically made, as I've mentioned uh, several times now, that uh, you know, we, uh, there are synthetic medications out there that um, uh, that we can administer that have the same effects as the body's own hormones. So if we need to increase the heart rate, we can give epinephrine. Uh, if we need to slow the heart rate down, we can give atropine. Uh, so we have uh, biological uh, synthetic medications that help minimize disease. Um, the general properties of drugs, generally they do not give the body new function. They use the existing function of the body and they uh, change it for a particular advantage. Um, 
and most medications exert multiple actions rather than just a single effect. As an example, when we give atropine, um, you know that's going to slow. That's going to allow the heart rate to increase. That's the expected uh, therapeutic um, effect that we want to see when we give atropine. Uh, but it also dries your mouth out. So you know we have to be aware that when we're giving this particular dries your mouth out, it dilates your pupils, you know, those sort of things. So we need to know that the medications that we give um, have uh, multiple actions rather than just a single effect. Drugs come in multiple forms, you know, they come in as an elixir or an emulsion. Uh, we don't see many emulsions anymore, um, you know, that's more like a slurry, you know, settle on the bottom, uh, activated charcoal is a good example of an emulsion. Uh, and a, an elixir or a spirit may have some uh, alcohol in them. Um, a suspension is similar to an emulsion in that uh, medication is suspended in a, uh, you know, into a, solutes are suspended into a solution and they often have to be uh, shaken up. Syrups like cough syrups, uh, tinctures like uh, wintergreen, oil of wintergreen. Uh, solid forms of drugs includes caplets, capsules, enterically coated tablets that uh, dissolve further in the GI tract, uh, gel caps, pills, powders. Um, we don't use many powdered drugs. There are some that, you know, like uh, TNK is a fibrinolytic that is administered for um, ST segment elevated myocardial infarctions. And um, uh, it's a powder that has to be reconstituted. And some of our antibiotics that you might give if you're hospital-based powders that have to be reconstituted. Uh, and then some drugs come in the form of a suppository or a tablet. Uh, and they each have their advantages. You know, caplets and capsules are usually easier to swallow. Uh, enterically coated tablets like uh, an enterically coated aspirin uh, dissolves in the duodenum and, um, you know, prevents things like uh, peptic ulcers and that sort of stuff. Gel caps and the liquid medicine in a capsule uh, that dissolves quickly and is supposed to get into your bloodstream faster. Pills are the standard, you know, round uh, or oval disc of compressed powder. Um, powders, as I mentioned, were the, uh, uh, the fibrinolytic and some uh, antibiotics. Suppositories are in a, it's a solid form, but it quickly dissolves in, in, at, at low temperatures. And then a, a tablet is uh, very similar to a capsule or a caplet. Um, there are some gas drugs that, that we uh, give, that we inhale and absorb through the respiratory tract. Um, they say they're commonly used for anesthesia and not very common for EMS, but I guess uh, at, uh, albuterol is uh, uh, not necessarily a gas. It's a liquid that is uh, atomized into a vapor and then in, but and they must not consider that a gas. Now these drugs have local and systemic effects. Local effects means it affects a specific part of the body. Uh, systemic affects the entire body. And, uh, <coughs> and enteral routes, these are the routes in which the medication are given. Uh, an enteral route uh, passes through any portion of the digestive tract. So if you give a drug enterally, um, then uh, that's usually a drug that's been swallowed and has to pass through the digestive tract. Uh, oral is the uh, number one enteral route. Uh, it has a first pass effect. Uh, the drug is broken down in the liver and the intestinal walls before it reaches the bloodstream. So it often takes a while. Uh, sublingual is an enteral route as well, and that's medications that we give under the tongue. And uh, under the tongue is uh, a lot of blood vessels, um, so uh, medication gets absorbed into uh, the bloodstream much faster given sublingual than uh, if you take it orally. Uh, nitroglycerin is the drug that we give sublingually, um, but the patients must be adequately hydrated for the drug to be absorbed. Buccal is uh, between the mouth, uh, it, between the cheek and gum, uh, laying up against the mucous membrane and the uh, medication is absorbed into the bloodstream uh, through the mucous membranes um, and uh, 
glutose paste is a good example of a buccal route. Uh, rectal is a suppository and it eliminates some of the first pass effect because you're at the very distal end of the intestines. So it doesn't have to be broken down by the intestines. It's dissolved and rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream uh, uh, from the, uh, uh, the very vascular uh, colon. Uh, gastric, uh, that's when we put a tube in the uh, patient and uh, place the medication directly into their stomach. It can be a uh, NG tube, a nasogastric tube through the nose, it can be an oral gastric tube through the mouth, or it can be a gastrostomy where a, a hole is made into the abdomen and a, a tube is placed directly into the stomach. Um, it's called a G tube. Parental routes. Uh, medication does not pass through the digestive tract, and these avoid first pass effect. And parental routes include the routes where the medications are given because we need a rapid, complete absorption. Uh, the most common parental route is going to be intravenously, uh, and that's where we give the drug directly into the venous circulation, and the effects are instantaneous. Interosseous is a needle that passes through the bone cortex and infused into the capillary network. And depending upon the site that you choose for intraosseous, uh, you can get um, you know, just as fast an absorption as if you gave it through an IV. All things that we give through an IV, we can give through an IO, and uh, we'll certainly learn how to do that as part of this course. Intracardiac is not something that we do anymore. Uh, it is a parental route, and that's where the medication is directly injected into the heart. Uh, we used to do this in cardiac arrest, uh, not as paramedics, uh, but uh, physicians would. Uh, they would take that very long needle and, and uh, bury it into a patient's chest between their ribs uh, into the, the site where they believe the uh, ventricle was and inject the medication directly into the ventricle. Uh, we saw this with uh, intra intracardiac uh, epinephrine, uh, and it was um, uh, glorified certainly in in Pulp Fiction, uh, where the person uh, gets an intracardiac <laughs> injection of adrenaline. But it's not a paramedic skill. Uh, endotracheal, uh, that's a parental route as well. We give the drug down an endotracheal tube. Um, the problem with giving drugs down an endotracheal tube is that we really don't know how much of the drug uh, gets absorbed, and so the response that we're going to get is really unpredictable. Uh, and as a result of that, we often have to give two times the IV dose if we're giving a drug down an endotracheal tube. And if the IV dose is a significant amount of volume, as an example, epinephrine is 10 milliliters, uh, uh, or atropine is uh, 10 milliliters. If we have to give two or three milligrams of that particular drug uh, down an ET tube, we're given you know, 30 milliliters of liquid, and uh, it's very difficult get that absorbed. Inhalation is a parental route, and that's where drugs are humidified and nebulized, as in the case of uh, a meter dose inhaler or um, a small volume nebulizer, and the medication goes directly into the respiratory tract where it's absorbed directly into the bloodstream. Intralingual is, is something that uh, we don't do, but it, it has been proposed. Uh, intralingual is the direct injection of a drug under the tongue uh, with a syringe and needle. Um, uh, one of the older ways of administering Narcan for narcotic overdose uh, or even epinephrine for a severe anaphylaxis where you couldn't get an IV established uh, was to uh, do an intralingual injection. Uh, but now we can give medications intranasally uh, where they're absorbed through the uh, mucous membrane. And, and Narcan is one of those drugs that uh, is being allowed to be given intranasally even by family members of uh, patients who have uh, uh, addictions to heroin. So intranasal routes uh, go through the nasal passages uh, and into the sinuses. Uh, where they're absorbed into the bloodstream. Um, the intranasal route, uh, you know, as I said, is just something that's uh, been popularized over the last couple of years and um, often have to give higher than the IV dose because absorption may or may not be similar uh, depending on the booger factor. I mean, 
if their nose is impacted with snot, um, it's going to be difficult to get the drug uh, to absorb through the mucous membranes. Intramuscular is another parental route, and that's injected directly into the skeletal muscle. Uh, uh, you'll learn to, to do that as well in your labs. You'll give IM injections. Uh, subcutaneous, uh, the liquid from the uh, injection is placed underneath the skin into the subcutaneous tissue. Um, the subcutaneous tissue is where uh, you know, your fat is, and the blood supply isn't as great in the subcutaneous tissue. So the issue with subcutaneous injections and medications is a longer, slower, uh, you know, slower absorption rate, long, it lasts longer, that sort of thing. Um, but we rarely give any drugs subcutaneous anymore because uh, we need the drugs to work quickly when we're giving them, as an example. Um, uh, we used to give epinephrine sub-Q for uh, anaphylaxis. Well, if somebody's in anaphylactic shock, blood supply to the fat is even less than to the muscle. So we now give it only IM. Transdermal uh, is a parental route, and transdermal is where the drugs are absorbed through the skin. It's a very slow, slow absorption rate, and they're going to have a patch on their arm, their chest, their back. Um, you know, it might be a nitroglycerin patch, it might be a nicotine patch. Uh, they make patches. Uh, that have uh, uh, medications on them to uh, help uh, with vomiting and dizziness. You might also see one of them behind the ear, uh, particularly in, in patients who um, fly and get uh, flight sickness, that sort of thing. Uh, might be a little Dramamine, you know, something to help with dizziness. Uh, estrogen might be on the buttocks and thighs, and uh, pain relief patches, uh, fentanyl patches, those sort of things, certainly can be placed anywhere. Uh, intrathecal is into the spinal cord, um, and that's not something that we do. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, women during delivery may have uh, an intrathecal injection uh, uh, to help uh, with the pain. Um, and then uh, we see it given to patients with uh, chronic back pain as well. They'll get an intrathecal injection of a steroid or something to help with inflammation and pain. Um, that's not a paramedic skill. Umbilical, uh, it's used in newborns, uh, and it does require special training and approval from your medical director, uh, but uh, uh, that's where you, you access an umbilical vein uh, and give medication to the newborn uh, through that umbilical vein. Uh, another parental route is intradermal. And that's between the dermal uh, skin layers. And um, th this isn't so much a medication as much as it is a test. Uh, we do uh, intradermal routes uh, when doing uh, TB tests. Now, as far as the mechanism of drug action, uh, the pharmaceutical phase is when solids are broken down into solution for absorption by the body. Uh, and the uh, pharmacokinetics of how these um, uh, liquids then get absorbed uh, through um, uh, the GI tract into the bloodstream, that sort of stuff, uh, are the same processes that we've talked about already to include passive transport, where they just uh, passively move from one semipermeable membrane to another. Diffusion, uh, solute concentration goes from a higher area to a lower area. Osmosis has to deal with the the actual liquid being moved from one place to the other. Facilitated transport, um, uh, you know, that's where you've got to have a helper to get a, uh, to get a drug into, um, uh, into the bloodstream or into the cell. Uh, facilitated transport uh, insulin is a good example of that, where uh, insulin is necessary uh, to facilitate the transport of glucose into the cell. Uh, uh, the stages of drug function start with uh, absorption, and the absorption of drugs uh, can vary depending upon the route. Uh, obviously, uh, the therapeutic effect is what we want to see. Uh, the outcome is, uh, did the drug work as it was expected or as expected? And if it doesn't, it might have to do with the absorption. If it's given as an example, I said, if you, you, know, if you give a drug sub-Q into the fat and the patient's in shock, 
uh, that's going to be uh, it's going to take a while for that drug to reach its therapeutic effect. Uh, enteric absorption occurs through uh, most of the duodenum, and we see this in um, uh, enterically coated medications or time release medications, where um, you know we want the medication to um, uh, to release itself in the duodenum, like with aspirin, so we don't cause uh, stomach problems with ulcers and that sort of thing. Uh, or we want the medication to be, release, to be released slowly over a period of, of uh, 24 hours. And then parental, uh, parenteral absorption is uh, through the capillaries. Um, now, medications don't necessarily um, you know, go directly uh, to the target organs. Uh, there's a blood-brain barrier in the, in the brain that selectively allows only certain chemicals to come in. Uh, and then the placental barrier is the same, where the placenta, um, you know, doesn't allow uh, certain medications uh, to pass uh, into the fetal circulation because it would be detrimental to the fetus. Um, metabolism is uh, how the drugs uh, metabolize and what sort of chemical reactions occur, uh, how, uh, how the drug goes from being active uh, to inactive, uh, that's the process of uh, metabolism, and then less active, inactive, to more active, uh, that's part of metabolism as well. And then uh, the last thing to think of is how is the drug uh, excreted or eliminated. Many medications are excreted in urine. Uh, or eliminated by the liver, uh, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, this was the whole drug receptor interaction. This is an example of that uh, receptor being a, um, uh, being a keyhole and the drug or the hormone or the neurotransmitter being the key. And uh, when that drug or hormone binds with the receptor, uh, it unlocks that function on the organ and we get a predictable response. Um, some theories concerning drug actions. Uh, the affinity of a, a drug is how intense it is. Uh, the efficacy is how well it works. Uh, an agonist uh, is, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, an agonist activates those receptors where an antagonist blocks those receptors. Uh, and then acetylation is um, drugs that are processed by enzymes. Um, some other things to think about drugs is the plasma level profile. And certainly this can be seen in a, a lab test where uh, they can see the amount of drug in, in dissolved in blood uh, and the half-life of a drug is how long uh, does it take uh, to metabolize uh, to a point where half the original dose you gave is gone or eliminated. And as an example, epinephrine has a half-life of every three to five minutes. So we can give that drug uh, every three to five minutes in cardiac arrest because of its short half-life. Um, whereas um, vasopressin, uh, has a uh, seven-week half-life, uh, so uh, we give that drug once in cardiac arrest. Therapeutic threshold is the threshold uh, in the blood that can be measured by the plasma level profile. But the the uh, therapeutic threshold is the uh, the level of uh, or amount of drug in the blood necessary to achieve to achieve a therapeutic response to achieve the outcome that you want with that drug. Uh, therapeutic index is uh, the measurement of the margin of safety. And you look at LD50, uh, lethal dose 50. Uh, that's the dose of a medication um, that if I put that dose uh, into the bodies of 100 people, 50 of them would die. Uh, so uh, they look at the LD50 dose for the therapeutic index. Uh, factors that influence uh, drug action, certainly age has a lot to do with it. Um, the older you are, uh, if your liver's not working,
working well, if your kidneys aren't working well, then drug elimination is an issue. Uh, certainly uh, circulation to um, uh, your tissue uh, is an issue that affects uh, drug action. And it's important that when we think about age and medication that we really should consider reducing the standard dose of drugs in half when we're giving them to patients over 70, uh, particularly those patients if they're in shock. Uh, gender, uh, certainly um, whether you're male or female, uh, you have uh, different influences on how drugs act. Uh, body weight, uh, sometimes uh, because of body mass, uh, you may be required to give a higher dose of drug to get a therapeutic effect. Uh, the environment, uh, certainly that you're in, influence the action of a drug. Uh, you know, if you're in a uh, uh, if you're in a, an environment that really uh, is upsetting to a patient and you give a medication, you may have to give more of that medication to get them to calm down. The general health of the individual uh, is important too. Uh, a healthy individual is where most of these medications are, are studied on uh, and uh, then uh, people with uh, disease and other diseases uh, may affect the medications that you give. Uh, genetics um, and culture uh, certainly influence drug action. Um, you know, there are some cultures that refuse uh, any sort of medications. Uh, then you've got the emotional and psychological state of the patient, uh, the time of administration, the route that you choose, uh, whether they're taking any other medications that would counteract with the ones that you give, and then their diet because certain medications uh, may be affected by what a patient eats. Um, how a drug uh, responds can be predictable. Uh, it can be iatrogenic, uh, in other words, that, that has to do with the patient themselves, and then unpredictable responses. Uh, we hope that when we give a medication that the response is predictable. Uh, in patients who are pregnant, um, uh, they go through certain uh, physiologic changes that affect their ability to metabolize. Um, and uh, a teratogen is a drug or an agent that is harmful to the embryo or fetus development. So when patients are pregnant, uh, they have to be very careful about what medications they take, if any at all, uh, because uh, those drugs may be harmful uh, to the fetus. Uh, and then the FDA uh, in all their medications, in all their medication profiles, uh, list the pregnancy risk of uh, a pregnant patient receiving that drug. Um, pediatric patients, uh, we dose our drugs by weight. Uh, we can use some length-based colored tape. Uh, Roslo is one, but there are others. Roslo is the original length-based colored tape. When the patent wore off, you know, many people are making a length-based colored tape. You lay it out on the patient, it gives you an estimate of what that patient should weigh in kilograms because most all the medications we give uh, are based by weight in kids. Uh, with geriatric patients, we kind of mentioned that you know, as they age, they lose bone mass, they lose lean muscle, uh, they have issues with, with uh, hydration, uh, their body fat decreases, uh, their organs don't function properly, particularly their liver and their kidneys. Uh, and then polypharmacy uh, is uh, a situation where a patient uh, may take five or more medications and as, as a result may make errors in administering those medications. Um, some other factors influencing how a drug works is that certainly if you give the drug in the intestinal tract, if you give it on an empty stomach, the absorption might be faster than if you give it on a full stomach. How the drug is metabolized or how it's biotransformed in the liver uh, it depends a lot on liver function. Uh, what sort of action at the receptor site, if there's a lot of uh, open receptor sites, uh, then you're going to get that predictable response. Uh, how well the drug uh, is excreted by the kidneys. When we look at the liver uh, metabolism and, and renal uh, excretion, uh, if those two organs aren't functioning properly, uh, you can get a uh, buildup of medication over a period of time to where the drug is at toxic levels inside the patient. 
Um, we also have to consider uh, if they have uh, changes in their potassium, changes in their sodium. Uh, we also have to look at drug-to-drug -drug interactions. What drugs are they taking based on the drugs that I give? Um, uh, we also have to consider the competition for plasma protein binding and other drug interactions as well. And then drug incompatibility. Some drugs cannot be given together. They cannot be given through uh, the same IV line. Just one second here. Okay. Back again. Um, the vast majority of medications that we're going to give, um, there aren't uh, real concerns for drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Um, the doses that we give, the amounts that we give, the routes that we give them, there's not much drug-to-food interactions that we need to be worried about as well. They are things that, you know, as you learn more about different medications, you'll become familiar with which drugs you can't give together. Um, uh, you know, as an example, sodium bicarbonate is a, a a drug that may be given for metabolic acidosis, but it deactivates dopamine, it deactivates epinephrine, it causes the calcium salts to precipitate if you give it with calcium. So, um, you know, those are just things that you'll learn as, as we go on. Um, because our medications, uh, we have some, we carry, you know, certainly um, uh, benzodiazepines, we carry Narcotics. We carry uh, medications that could be abused, um, and some of them certainly in the wrong hands, like a paralytic, uh, could be deadly. Uh, so uh, the drugs have to be stored uh, in accordance to the laws of uh, Iowa uh, through the Iowa Board of Pharmacy. And uh, when not in attendance, they have to be double locked. Uh, some drugs have to be refrigerated, uh, as well as uh, temperature controlled. Uh, so follow your local protocols on how you restock your drug kit, how you check your drug kit out. Uh, it should always be checked before and after the shift. And that doesn't mean you have to open the drug kit up. Uh, it may be just the drug kit has a lock on it. And that lock has a number and you just verify that that number hasn't changed. Uh, typically pharmacies, at least because we're hospital based, our pharmacy does um, when they stock the drug kits, look at expiration dates, uh, and uh, uh, puts a, a sticker on the outside of our kit to let us know um, the most, the, you know, the, the drug that's going to expire the soonest, uh, so that we can make sure to keep an eye on it. Um, the quantity of medications, once a medication is used, we typically don't replace just that medication. Uh, we just swap out drug kits, and the old one goes up to pharmacy, and pharmacy uh, makes those changes and restocks them. Locking mechanisms are, you know, sometimes drugs are actually under lock and key. Other times they're just in in um, uh, bags uh, with uh, zip ties on them uh, that you have to break open. And you have to record uh, the number on the tie and who you were and what you took and what you used and what you spent and all that stuff. And that all of that information goes back to um, uh, pharmacy as well when the kid is being restocked. Um, you know, and that brings me to pharmacy in some services like uh, West Des Moines EMS. Uh, one of their stations is out in the middle of nowhere. So, um, you know, they've got an actual vending machine. Um, that they use to restock their drug kits. Um, it's kind of a unique concept, but it keeps track of who accessed it, what they took, um, that sort of thing, so that they can match that up with what was actually given. Um, the components of a drug profile, you know, these are things that you might see in your medication profile. You might see the generic and trade name of the drug. Uh, what sort of classification of drug is it? How is it supplied? And how it's how it's supplied can really vary, depending on on your pharmacist. Um, you know, 
cost is an issue in some situations, and so you may get drugs in a vial form, uh, or you may get them in a pre-filled syringe. And with the shortage of drugs and the availability of drugs, you may not even be able to get a particular drug that you commonly use, and you might have to use something else, which may require you to have some just-in-time training on the indications, contraindications, side effects, and route, and all that stuff. So also in your drug profile uh, is a mechanism of action, uh, the pharmacokinetics, how it breaks down, what's it's used for, the dose, any contraindications, uh, any precautions, side effects. It's important to know the side effects because as an example, if I give you nitroglycerin, uh, it's going to give you a headache. And if the patient's never had nitroglycerin and you give them this drug and they get a really severe headache, that might frighten them. Uh, so letting them know that you know, I'm going to give you this drug and it may make you lightheaded, may make you dizzy, may, make, may give you a headache, that sort of stuff. When they do experience that, they're not as, as scared. Uh, it also lists the routes that it can be administered, uh, what other drugs interact with it, uh, pregnancy risk factors. Uh, if a drug has an antidote, you know, certainly as an example, if we give too much morphine, uh, we can use Narcan as the antidote. Uh, if we give too much of a benzodiazepine, whether it's uh, Ativan, um, or Valium or Versed, uh, we have Romazicon as an antidote for that. Uh, and then special considerations. Do we need to think about anything special concerning the administration of this drug when dealing with pediatric patients or geriatric patients or pregnant patients? So in summary, the uh, drug trade name is um, the brand name, what we know it by at the store, uh, the generic is the chemical name, and the chemical name is the actual chemical structure of the compound. Uh, orphan drugs treat rare diseases and conditions. Uh, sources of drugs include plants, animals, products, minerals, synthetic chemicals, recombinant DNA technology, and we listed uh, some of the types of drugs. Three drug class systems include the body system, the class of the agent, the mechanism of action, where to get sources of information about drugs, including the PDR, uh, hospital formularies, uh, pocket references, package inserts, smartphone apps, that sort of thing. Uh, we looked at the regulation of drugs through the uh, different uh, acts that are out there. Talked about the U.S. Pharmacopeia being the official standard setting authority for the prescription of over-the-counter drugs and dietary supplements sold in the United States. Talked a little bit about the FDA approval process for drugs. Talked about uh, how to safe and uh, effective administration uh, of drugs for the, how that's a primary responsibility of the paramedic when giving medications is to make sure that they're given safe and effectively. We looked at the nervous system. Talked about the uh, central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. And then the peripheral nervous system, where all nerves outside of that. We divided the peripheral nervous system into the somatic nervous system, uh, where we had the sensory and motor nerves, and then the autonomic nervous system, which included the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. We talked about the sympathetic nervous system, or the adrenergic nervous system, which is called the fight or flight system, uh, adrenaline being the neurotransmitter for that, and the predictable response we can see when that nervous system is stimulated. We looked at the parasympathetic nervous system, or the cholinergic nervous system, the rest and digest, the feed and breed uh, nervous system, and uh, how when that nervous system is stimulated by acetylcholine, uh, we can see a predictable response. Uh, we talked about the synaptic transmission uh, between the pre- and post-ganglionic nerve fibers, uh, and then we looked at drugs and how they come in liquids, solids, and gases. We talked about drug route administration, uh, being enteral drugs uh, circulated by the GI tract or uh, parenteral drugs uh, that uh, enter the systemic circulation by bypassing the GI tract. Uh, and then we uh, talked about how medications alter normal body responses. Uh, we looked at pharmacokinetics, which is the process of how drugs are processed in the body, how they can be absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and excreted. We talked a little bit about agonist stimulation uh, on the receptors and how when the receptor sites are stimulated by the hormone or the medication, uh, the predictable response that we're going to get. Um, 
we talked about antagonists, which will block or bind the receptor and does not elicit a response. Uh, beta blocker is an example of a beta antagonist. Uh, it blocks those uh, beta receptors so that um, uh, when you give a beta drug, it doesn't work. <coughs> uh, we looked at the biological health half-life and the time <coughs> excuse me, are required to eliminate 50% of the blood from the uh, bloodstream. Uh, and we gave the example of uh, epinephrine having a uh, half-life of three to five minutes. We talked about how the FDA regulates drugs for the safety in pregnancy patients. Uh, we looked at some situations concerning pediatric and geriatric patients and how they may have different responses. Pediatric patients basing all their medications off weight, so much per kilogram, and uh, geriatric patients maybe even having to decrease, decrease uh, the normal amount of the drug based on their overall health status and how uh, drugs may have side effects that uh, may or may not be harmful, but the patient should be aware of what those side effects are. Uh, we talked about iatrogenic drug response and um, how unintentional disease uh, or the effect produced by the physician's prescribed therapy. Um, you know, iatrogenic means that we, we gave it, we caused it. An iatrogenic injury is an injury that we cause. An iatrogenic drug response is a drug response that, uh, that or a response that we see in a patient after giving them a drug. We looked at uh, drug action factors, including intestinal absorption, drug metabolism, how they're excreted, uh, the role of electrolytes, talked briefly about drug-to-drug -drug interactions, and then drugs that are incompatible with each other. Talked about uh, the storage of drugs and how they have to you know, meet the letter of the law according to the Iowa Board of Pharmacy. And then we talked about uh, a medication profile and uh, how it uh, listed a complete description of the drug and all its characteristics. Uh, with that then, uh, we have finished Chapter 11 and I will uh, talk to you soon.